I know it's been a few weeks because we've been doing uh, field trips and Tory conference and whatnot, um, but uh, our last in-class uh, lecture, we were talking about Rosalind Krauss, and uh, I didn't quite finish up on that, and I think it would be worthwhile to resolve that, finish, finish up on that. I'm also aware that I didn't finish the uh, postmodern lecture, so we'll get back to that at some point. Um, but I did want to finish up with Rosalind Krauss because I think it will give us um, some important things to talk about and a good excuse to look at some artists that we should be familiar with. Um, uh, so where we were t what we were talking about with Krauss, just to refresh our memories, is that she's talking about sculpture, right? And she's saying there, there have been some really strange things that have been counting as sculpture over the past uh, few years, the past decade. Uh, and she says what sculpture has come to be uh, defined as, essentially, is it's the thing in the landscape that's not the landscape. It's the thing in the uh, uh, architecture or in front of the architecture that's not the architecture. And that's what sculpture has become, which maybe is somewhat disappointing of a definition, but it gives us some real opportunity and possibility to uh, take, take this definition and open it up into a field. Uh, so her, her essay called Sculpture in the Expanded Field is taking sculpture, trying to uh, reimagine, reinterpret uh, how we can think about sculpture. Um, or maybe it's, maybe it's not sculpture, it's three-dimensional working, <laughs> I, I suppose we could say. Uh, working in the space of the world. So we talked about, uh, she names these other possibilities. Uh, it's possible, she says, that uh, we could we can make work that is simultaneously part of the landscape and part of architecture. It's simultaneously landscape and architecture. The inverse of this, uh, how we've been defining sculpture. And she wants to call that site construction. So we looked at a few people who, uh, whose work might be well defined as site construction. So the Vietnam War Memorial is simultaneously architecture and landscape. You can't really make sense of the thing without both of those terms. Um, so we looked at Maya Lin, we looked at Nancy Holt, that she's making sculptural architectural structures, but really it only is intelligible because of its orientation in landscape, its position in landscape. Uh, in some ways, it's looking at the landscape that becomes the work, <laughs> becomes the art. Um, so we looked at those, uh, and then we moved on from that to start looking at what she called marked sites, which she wants to define as these things that are simultaneously landscape and not landscape, uh, adjusting or altering the landscape itself as a means of working. Um, so in that category, we looked at uh, Robert Smithson, Um, and I think earlier on, or later on, so Smithson you can uh, locate in the 70s, Goldsworthy would be more in the 1990s, and the, this, currently he would still be working, he's still making these things. Um, and uh, with both Smithson and Goldsworthy, we have artists who are going into the landscape and altering the landscape, and the work is there. They're not bringing anything to it. I mean, Smithson's bringing tractors, but <laughs> he's not installing anything there. Neither is Goldsworthy. They're just altering or adjusting the landscape, altering and adjusting nature itself so that it, it reads as landscape. It's nature, but it's transformed nature. It causes us to look at nature, look at natural forms a little differently. Um, and I think we might, uh, we also grouped uh, Cristo into this category of being a marked site. But at this point, I think we kind of have to start making some distinctions, right? I mean, uh, with Smithson and Goldsworthy, it seems like uh, uh, the subject matter of the work, the, the content of the work, what we care about there has to do with nature itself. They want us to get. They want to get us to look at nature in a new way, a, a revised way, an enlivened way, to see in it 
patterns and movements and to experience uh, the landscape in one way or another. Christo seems to be about that to some extent. You could make sense of this work as uh, kind of getting us to pay attention to the wind and the light and the, the movement of the, the landscape and those sort of things. But there seems to be a whole lot else going on with Christo that we talked about, right? All these social systems. I mean, there's, this is as much a social landscape as it is a natural landscape in the sense that to, to pull this off, he is negotiating with the people who own these land, uh, these uh, um, properties. He's negotiating with government agencies and regulators, environmental regulators, and so on and so forth, so that in Christo's work, yeah, it's a marked site in a way, in Krauss's terms, but it's not marked in the same way or for the same reasons that like Smithson or Goldsworthy marked the site. This seems to have more of a social dimension to it, a cultural uh, dimension to it. Uh, that, that what Christo draws our attention to is not just the landscape itself, the natural space, but draws our attention to the way that we as a society use this land, market, regulate it, and, and kind of lay meaning on top of it. Does that, does that make sense? Um, so I think that's an important distinction to make. And just to slide in, uh, one more work from Christo. I'll do this every once in a while. Uh, slide in works we didn't see before, uh, even though we're reviewing. Um, uh, it's a remarkable work. Um, wrapped trees uh, causes us, I think, to look at these trees uh, differently. Causes perhaps concern for the trees initially. Um, uh, even though this would be a common practice to keep the trees alive during, uh, during winter, he wraps them in, in with this kind of porous membrane that uh, gets us seeing these things differently, paying attention differently. Not just to the landscape once again, but, but the sort of social spaces, the ways that we use uh, the landscape and use nature. Okay. Good, so that's pretty much review where we were. D did we include everything? Is that in, any questions at this point? <laughs> okay, uh, just to kind of uh, reboot and, and um, get us back into where we left off, because we didn't talk at all about this side of Krauss's field. Um, we're pretty clear, I think, by this point, of what uh, how site construction could be this possibility of working in um, the world's space that is simultaneously landscape and architecture. And it seems like we can understand how we can make work that is simultaneously landscape and not landscape. It's a transformed landscape. But we have to deal with this other quadrant of her field, the, the possibility for work that is simultaneously architecture and not architecture, transformed architecture, um, structures that uh, become art, uh, they become more than just architecture, I suppose, but they become art. Um, and she wants to call these axiomatic structures. Are you familiar with that word, axiomatic? It's sort of a, a $5 vocabulary word. Um, but it just means uh, uh, self-evident, that it's not something that is imposed, um, but it's it, the, the structure or the, the art in the structure is built into it. It's part of the structure. It can't be removed. Sort of self-evident in, in one way or another. And I think in this category, we're going to make the same distinction that we made or a similar distinction that we made in marked sites. Um, and we'll get into that a bit. Uh, and we'll, we'll start by uh, going back to Christo. Christo and Jean-Claude. Um, because I, uh, we've looked at some of their work where they're working in the landscape specifically, marking the landscape, but they also carried this on uh, by working in cities, in the cityscape, um, in architectural space. This is uh, the wrapping of the Reichstag in Germany, in Berlin. This is a massive building that they wrapped 
in similar ways that, that they, I mean, it has a somewhat similar function as perhaps running fence or the wrapped islands, but by wrapping a building like this, it seems to do something um, a little different, huh? Uh, what, how do you read this? What's going on here? How is this different than uh, running fence? I'll give you another point of view. It's wrapped in this, um, it's like a, a silvery, I wonder if I have it, I don't think I have it in my notes. It's, a, it's a, a, like a kind of silvery reflective fabric material, uh, somewhat similar to the running fence, yeah. And it is, as this picture shows, it's the entire building, <laughs> all the way over the top, on the insides of these courtyards, all the way around, uh, from, uh, from top to bottom, from bottom to top. And this is a massive building. It looks like it's taking something in more, like, than if you were only compared to the fence. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it looks like it's keeping something Yeah, 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 right? Um, <laughs> or has been condemned or something like that. Uh, and it's usually, there's some sort of danger that this is supposed to be keeping things in and keeping you out of. Okay, good, good, good. So, so maybe to, to uh, rephrase that a little bit, if, uh, if the running fence was redrawing fence lines in a way, dividing this space from that space, um, either new sets of properties or new um, states or something, drawing a new boundary. This one seems to maybe draw a new boundary between inside, outside. Uh, oh, not new, it's not a new boundary, reinforcing inside, outside. I, I, I heard that in, in what you were saying, that we tent it, we make it uh, less accessible to get in. Uh, it, 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 inside outside becomes the boundary that gets emphasized. Does that do justice to at least part of what you were saying? <laughs> Sorry. Okay, good, yeah. It seems to kind of displace it from the environment because it's um, just like the fabric over this huge building is so different from like the pavement and everything. Yeah, yeah, good, good, good. Displaces it because it's different and, and uh, say more about the difference. How's this different than it was or different from the pavement? It's, uh, <clears throat> it's well, it kind of makes me think like it was pulled out of like a storybook uh -huh. in a way, just because of the form is, it's not, I mean, it is structured, but it's not like, the typical architecture that that you see, like in the environment that it's in. Uh, okay, okay. It seems to like some form of the function of the thing. Like when I look at it, all I see is like the form of the thing. Uh -huh. I don't, like I don't see a building. Like uh, I don't see like architecture. Ah. Uh, I see like the, just like the shapes or the form. Yeah. Yeah, good, good, good. It's like somehow like, it's like different from the pavement, like the pavement you still see, like you see like it in its of itself and its function, like you walk on uh, it versus like this building, which is no longer really a building, it's just like this giant massive form. Yeah, 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 good. It, I, uh, it, we can maybe uh, could say that it's, it's muffled. It's like the the social function of the of the building is muffled. All of the ornamentation, kind of everything, all any symbols that would be on this building, even the kind of um, the way that this building projects power um, and and history, meaning, content feels muffled. It, it also feels a little different from its environment because the fabric, um, because of the way that it hangs, the way that it's somewhat malleable, the way that it adjusts to the contours of the building, make it sort of, sort of light in a way. It's like the whole thing has become um, 
um, light uh, or removed or malleable or muffled. Um, uh, the the it 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 gets uh, it gets taken out of its environment to some extent. It gets removed. It gets marked off. It gets uh, it gets cloaked. It gets muffled. Maybe it also sort of reads like. Uh, a, a, in, a, in a sort of haunting way of something dead, something covered, something wrapped, a body in a way. Uh, good, any other things you want to say about, about that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, good. It's a little bit of a, a it's, it's bound in some ways. It doesn't just hang loosely, but it seems bound, it seems tied up, it seems packaged in a way, yeah. It actually reminds me of like an iceberg, so it kind of like, like this ah. cold, huh. solid feeling. Huh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, good, At, yeah. Seems like it, huh? Yeah. yeah. I mean that they chose this particular building, the Reichstag. I mean this is a this is sort of um, has a pretty thick history uh, in Germany, including uh, when it was in Nazi hands. Um, that I I, I don't uh, want to go into too much, largely from. Uh, ignorance, I don't know that I could talk very intelligently about it, but it's, it's a loaded history. When you wrap this particular building, I mean, it would be somewhat analogous to wrapping a, a, a Capitol building or a, um, a, a, a central monument in a city, whatever that might be in LA. Yeah, which is it, like overtly political in one way or another muffling this or removing it from its context, making the thing feel strange, uh, strange um, seems to be a very important part of the work, huh? Yeah. Good, at any rate, uh, we can see how this might be characterized, uh, located on Krauss's field in the axiomatic side of things, where it's architecture, but it's not architecture. Um, and in that uh, classification or category, it would seem that this has a pretty uh, strong social dimension to it, a cultural dimension. By, by doing this to the architecture, you're, you're um, uh, I don't know, highlighting it, uh, causing, uh, calling into question the ways that we use this building, the ways we, uh, it has gathered histories and we associate things with it, uh, histories to it. There seems to be a social, cultural, historical reason behind the work. And they've done this in a, new, a number of places, so they seem to be um, uh, uh, kind of concentrating this wrapping strategy in the landscape on the one hand and on architectural structures on the other. This is a Roman wall from Rome that once again you wrap it and the thing suddenly becomes strange just by wrapping it, becomes highlighted. So there seems to be this cultural dimension to this axiomatic structure strategy, and we'll, we'll get back to that, but that's not the only uh, kind of category in this way of working. Um, we also have a, a sort of a line of thinking that emerges in the late 60s especially that seems to alter architectural spaces, changing them into something more or something else that comes more from the minimalist train of thought, right? Uh, Robert Irwin would be a, a good example of this. This is an untitled work uh, that is uh, constructed out of this scrim fabric that is hung, uh, that is installed in the, in the gallery room and uh, it <coughs> interacts with lights, it's lit in special ways, so that uh, what it appears to be this 
sheet of light or sheet of glass or something that divides the a sheet of light that divides the space. And I think in Krauss's categories, we ask, is this a sculpture? <laughs> is this architecture? Is this installation? Is it art? I suppose we could ask. That's a little annoying to ask. Uh, but it seems to kind of transgress sculpture. It seems hard to understand it as sculpture, but it does seem easier to understand it as altered architecture. It's dependent on the architectural space, but it's been altered to provide a, a new or different experience of it. Was there a hand up? Yeah. Yeah, it's a room. Here, I've got some better details. So that you're at about eye height. The photo's taken from about eye height here. Um, so you can see this sort of scrim that's semi-transparent. Um, and uh, here it's installed at a different time with a kind of brighter light. This seems even <laughs> more uh, more difficult to pin down what you're looking at, but it gives you some sense of scale. This just sheet sheet of light that's that is um, that transforms the space. It's an odd experience. A, a Robert Irwin work, and he experiments with this in in a lot of ways, where he's taking elements of the architecture. And the work becomes, um, in, in a lot of ways, only present in that space. It can't be removed without the work disappearing. Um, uh, this is uh, one of his earlier um, explorations into this. Um, and there are a lot of these. You'll see these uh, fairly often if you see um, exhibitions that focus on minimalism or the work from the 1960s and 70s, or specifically the light and space movement, which is what uh, Irwin gets associated with. What is, the, what is the material, or what are the materials that he's primarily interested in? Light and space. The, the, the actual things that he is manipulating are secondary to what the light and the space does. What this thing is, is a disc. He starts as a painter, and he eventually just uh, distances himself, lets go of the painting, um, and starts making objects that facilitate light, lighting, the division of space through light. So this is a disc um, that's made out of some sort of a, um, uh, shoot, what is it? Um, like a, it's, it's not a plastic, but a, a, it's not a resin. It's slipping my mind what it is. But it's this disc, this white disc, that gets translucent in the middle, this stripe, and has this dark region somewhere behind it. And you're not really exactly sure how, where it is. It's floating off of the wall, but how it's installed. And then the thing is always lit in such a way that these circles that emerge on the wall and these interlocking circles are shadows, light and shadows, it's a play of light and shadow. And they are strange to see in person. If you ever, if you ever see these in person, stare at the center for, mm, give it 20 or 30 seconds and something very strange happens. <laughs> they, they disappear. It's, I, I, don't, I don't entirely know how to describe it, you just have to go see these if, if uh, if you get a chance here in LA. I don't think any are up right now, but Mocha owns one. Uh, but you, you stare at this black center and eventually you're just looking at a blank wall. It's the weirdest experience I've ever had. Uh, no, no, that's not true, <laughs> not ever. <laughs> I, uh, it's a weird experience. Um, and, uh, and that is very important to Irwin. It seems that this manipulation of light and space that he would become well known for is um, he's primarily interested in visual experience, right? The visual experience of of light and uh, operating in space, the space of our bodies. More recent work from him, he's still taking architectural elements and just repositioning them. For instance, taking fluorescent lighting 
uh, not placing it on the ceilings, but placing them on the walls. Another artist that's associated with this light and space movement is James Terrell. James Terrell's work is, uh, often looks something like this, where uh, you'll walk into a room, um, especially from the 80s and 90s, you walk into a room and there will be this glowing, mysteriously glowing rectangle on the wall that's usually a very saturated color, like blue in this instance. And uh, the closer you get to it, the less you're able to identify what the thing is. <laughs> what is this glowing blue rectangle? Uh, what is it? Where is it? Um, and uh, with some investigation, you realize there's nothing there at all. There's, there's emptiness. What was presenting itself as a positive colored shape is in fact an absence, it's a void. And uh, there's, it's uh, fairly difficult to tell what it is you're looking at because you peer into this blue and there's nothing, there's nothing to see. You don't know how deep it is, you don't know, there's nothing, there's nothing to see other than this potent blue color. Um, uh, to kind of uh, um, let out the secret, uh, it is, there are two rooms, one of which the other side is spherical in structure, so there are no corners, you can't see corners, there's no sort of definition of how, how deep it is or what's closer or what's further away, and the wall comes to a sort of razor edge so that you don't even see the width of the wall. It's just, there's just this strange, empty, glowing, blue. Uh, and it's an experience where that, that indeterminacy of depth, this thing is in front of my body and I can't locate it and I can't pin it down, um, is the experience that Terrell is uh, very interested in. Um, to, to give us experiences that in one way or another point towards transcendence, something that can't be grasped bodily or visually. And some of these are whole, are whole rooms, very large. Uh, Terrell also uh, cuts holes in the ceiling. <laughs> He's interested in creating these, these blue spaces that we looked at, not only blue, some of them are red and green and whatever. Uh, so he experienced, or he creates these experiences in the walls, but he also uh, creates th these experiences in the ceiling so that we find ourselves with the rectangle. The rectangle we're familiar with from photography and painting, but it is the sky that is that presents itself. Um, and he adjusts the way that we see that sky so that uh, we have a, a rectangular hole in the ceiling. We're looking to the heavens and uh, he lights the rooms from below in changing colors. He has the ability to change these colors and so the way that we perceive the sky in relation to these colors causes this advance and receding of that color, right? If, if you've taken any kind of basic color theory, you know something about how you can cause certain colors to advance, others to recede, warm colors and saturated colors and, and cool colors receding according to how you mix them. So that this sky, especially when it's absent of the clouds, um, becomes this shape that advances and recedes rather than just a hole in the ceiling. Uh, and once again, he's very interested in that, um, uh, prompting that experience of us not being able to place a thing that we thought we knew, <laughs> like the room next door or the sky that's always overhead. And you get some sense from these photographs of how, how, um, they adjust how they change and how they, this square or rectangle or trapezoid uh, advances and recedes. And of course, then there's a strong sense of time that uh, is associated with these works. 
So the time of day is what changes the sky and uh, his lights that accompany that and he sets next to it um, change over time. So we have this strange interplay between, I suppose, the heavens and the earth, setting them in proximity to each other and then mm -hmm. them, them changing in relation to each other. And of course, that language that I've been using is pretty heavily, has a, has a religious spin to it, a spiritual spin to it. Uh, Terrell is a Quaker, he was raised as a Quaker. Um, and uh, and his, if, if you hear him talk about his work, there's a, a spiritual spin to it. Um, he talks a lot about science and just how our eyes work and how we perceive color. He's really well um, learned on that point. Uh, so you get a strong dose of that from him and you get a strong dose of the immaterial, the spiritual, the transcendent. That if his work can prompt experiences of the transcendent or get us thinking about the transcendent, bodily, that something, something escapes our grasp bodily, uh, then, uh, uh, then his work is doing what uh, he wants it to do. So he, all of that to say that he has um, done one of these sky spaces for a Quaker meeting house. And in this instance too, the, the lights the lights on the ceiling will change and adjust as the light uh, outside changes, the light in the sky. Um, and just to let you know, there's one of these permanently installed close to us, if you want to see one, um, at Pomona College. He installed, not long ago, what was it, uh, four years ago or so, um, installed this pavilion at Pomona College that operates in the same way. But in this instance, you have the rectangle cut in the hole of the, or a rectangular hole cut in the ceiling of the pavilion that is matched by, literally mirrored by a, a reflecting pool. So you get these sort of, um, the whole thing is changing over, over time with light uh, not only coming through the hole and being projected up into the ceiling, but being reflected through this, this pool. And there's some pretty phenomenal radical changes that happen. From what, uh, um, if, if you do go see this, uh, I'm told that the best times to go are sunrise and sunset for obvious reasons, or the hour the hour before and after sun, sunrise and sunset because that's when you'll get the most change in the sky. Um, just so you know, uh, Terrell has for the last 30 years or so been working on his kind of masterpiece uh, that is called Roden Crater. He purchased a crater <laughs> in Arizona, and uh, he has been working for the last 30 years to construct spaces on the inside of this crater. The thing is going to be a massive observatory slash visual experience. Um, I haven't been. I've, I've heard that in one way or another you can go visit this, though I don't think it's formally sort of open and finished yet. But to give you a kind of sneak preview, I think he's, in, in a, uh, he's doing a lot of things. It's a pretty elaborate complex, but he's building, he's building eyes <laughs> to, to look at the sky. This sort of uh, experience that goes over and over in his work of looking at the sky, trying to behold the sky, and the sky being something you can't quite pin down. And in, in a lot of ways, the sky, as you see here, this is uh, in the Crater Project, um, becomes a, a sort of sculptural object in its own way, right? Because it advances and recedes, he makes it material and he, he confines it, he turns it into a sort of object, a visual object. Okay. Um, at any rate, uh, with all of these, I'm, I'm kind of grouping them into that axiomatic structure category where it's architecture and not architecture at the same time. It's not an installation. It's not a thing that you um, 
put into a space necessarily, but it's a transformation of that space itself so that the work is the space. It is the light in the space. It's the, it's the architecture, but it's not just architecture. <laughs> Does that make sense? And I think with uh, both Irwin and Terrell and the whole light and space movement, there are other light and space artists you can look up, um, but with that whole movement, they're primarily interested in visual experience uh, um, of, of light. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's an aesthetic experience, for lack of a better word, a spiritual experience, but there's not a heavy cultural or social commentary element to it. We get that social or, uh, or cultural commentary element from, I think, artists like Christo. So I do want to make a, a, a kind of division in the way that we're talking about this, these axiomatic structures. One uh, that is very interested in optical experience, structuring spaces so that we have Mm, tremendous visual experiences there. And the other that we can go back to Christo to talk about is uh, handling architectural spaces, turning them to not quite architectural spaces um, for the purpose of getting us to re-see the way that architectural spaces are shaping our lives, right? Um, how do they shape us? How do they shape our patterns, our routines, the way that we interact with each other, the way that we collaborate um, socially or fail to collaborate. And I think this is gonna be the more influential strain that follows us in the years after the 70s uh, into the 90s. So I wanna pick up on this strain and go past Christo a little bit and fill, in, fill it in with a couple of other, a couple other artists. Uh, one of the most famous artists I think we can put in this category, or infamous or whatever, is Gordon Mata Clark. Are any of you familiar with the surrealist painter Mata? Mata, no, he was a, um, where is he from? Uh, South America, I don't remember off the top of my head. Uh, but he's a surrealist painter uh, from the, or you can kind of group him in the early 20th century, mid 20th century. Gordon Mata Clark is his son, if that's of interest to you. And this work is called Splitting. And what do you see here? What is splitting? A house, where he has taken a house, um, uh, an abandoned house, and has cut it in half. And you gotta, you gotta kind of realize how difficult that is to do. Because you're not just, I mean, it's not like you just take a big saw and go uh, You're cutting through the walls, but you're having to cut through all of the walls and the ceilings and the floor joists and everything like that, and whatever staircases, railings, doorways, whatever might be in that line, he's, he's making this sort of perfect cut through all of them. And then he, is, he puts the thing on jacks and then gradually starts removing its foundation so that the thing begins to open up, crack open, splitting. What does it mean to split a house like this? How do you read this? And here it is from the other side. What does this do to you? What does it do for you? How do you interpret this? Read this. Yeah, who's, who's talking? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we pretty quickly read this symbolically, huh? That this is home family splitting, not just a, a, an architectural structure. Yeah. Anyone want to add to that? How else do you relate to this? Mm. Divorce happens so often, um, but you don't usually think about it. 
about like the house splitting um, as symbolic of that. Mm. Yeah, it's something extremely metaphorical that has been made extremely concrete, <laughs> almost ab sort of absurdly or obsessively so. Like there, you know, there's no, there's no, it, well, yeah, it's something very metaphorical made very concrete. Yeah. Um, I saw this like creating kind of a perfect natural disaster, like huh. an earthquake happened, houses fell down, cars fell down, huh. like Yeah, 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 yeah. A kind of idealized split. Yeah. An idealized disaster. I suppose we might also be able to read into the fact that um, it doesn't split. Uh, well, we can read it as the house being divided against itself. Maybe we could read into that. Um, uh, but a house being divided and then one half of it the, uh, the, the foundation being compromised. It's not the, a compromise of the whole foundation, but it's a, even if you were to split this thing, the, it, it would remain largely intact, uh, but one side falls away. One sort of half of the foundation becomes compromised, becomes unstable, and it makes the whole house uh, useless or unstable in, in one way or another. It can no longer function as a whole because half of it uh, splits away. Yeah? And it's strange that it's such a clean cut also. Yeah. If it, if it wasn't, if the foundation wasn't altered, it would be like, kind of like a minimalist sculpture. Uh, uh -huh. It's kind of so straight down the middle yeah. because it's that slightly askew. It's really interesting because it's not like a family break where you, if it's just messy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's surgical. <laughs> it's not. It's not a, a fracturing, a, a breaking. It's a splitting, and maybe that makes it read as just more idealized, more symbolic, um, in a way, like symbolic as in removed. There's no messiness to it. There's no. There's no. Uh, it's it's as it's as in simple a form as possible. Yeah, good. And uh, what he did, uh, not only to the outside, but to the inside, survives in photographs of the whole house opening up uh, in the center, including, as I said, the stairways, the railings. The whole thing opens up uh, from the center. And uh, I think it's important that we notice that it is preserved in photographs. Um, photography, in a lot of the work that we're gonna look at for the remainder of the day, photography starts to serve this purpose of documentation or artifact, memory. It provides memory that the house no longer exists and even visiting the house in some ways wouldn't be the point. It's the opening up of the house that um, is preserved in photographs. And so the photograph is the thing that remains and maybe the stories about it or whatever we can say about it uh, remains, but the, 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 photograph, um, the photograph serves as our only means to the, the concept or to the, to the idea, to the work. The photograph remains, nothing else remains. And we're gonna see that that element of time, something being so temporal that it lasts for only a, long, a short period of time and then passes away, and all we have is a photograph to document it or as an artifact of it, um, that's gonna be really important as we start getting into performance. Uh, work gets incre increasingly time-based um, in the second half of the century. And uh, Gordon Mata Clark seems to play with this. He seems to grant special place to the photograph in that the works, I mean, in one way or another, the work is the house, the splitting of the house, but it then 
fairly quickly becomes, the, the photographs that document it become their own work. So for instance, he, he uh, arranges, organizes photographs in this way, which is not possible, right? I mean, this is a, this is a, um, a compiling of multiple photographs together to reconstruct the house, right? Because we've got a point of view where we're looking at the room from sort of human head height, and we're looking at that room from human head height, and that room from human head height, and even the attic. Uh, and the whole thing is then a, a compilation, a kind of strange compilation of the house, reconstruction of the house. And he becomes pretty playful with these. How do you document this place that uh, no longer survives? How do you document it? Is the traditional kind of grouping of rectangular photographs into a grid the most appropriate way to do it? Or do you start grouping them in the way that if I'm standing in this house, I look through the house, uh, which will arrive me at a different a different arrangement, a different, uh, a different arrangement of the photographs. How do I document this place? The photograph is what we have, but the photograph is, is partial in a way. Question? Yeah. I noticed that he didn't live very long. Though, yes, he didn't live very long. Um, uh, and actually, I'll talk about that a little bit here in a bit. But he was cutting these buildings, and he did lots of these, uh, cutting through buildings. And uh, he, he was cutting through things somewhat cavalierly in the sense that, you know, this is in the 70s. Um, uh, house paint, commercial paint is made out of lead. There's all sorts of asbestos uh, uh, in, in ceilings and in floors. And he's just boring through the whole thing. Uh, so he, he gets sick. I think, it's, I think it's lung cancer that he gets from as, the asbestos. And he dies in his 30s from his art making, <laughs> from this, uh, this sort of um, dismantling of these buildings. So another. Another warning to you all, be careful. Do ambitious, outrageous things, but take care of your bodies. <laughs> Good. Uh, and he will uh, cut through buildings. Uh, uh, almost all abandoned buildings, usually, usually buildings that are slated to be torn down, he goes in and he uh, tears them up, sometimes with permission, sometimes not. That's your question. Uh, yeah, sometimes. I mean, he was, he was at least, I mean, he's not, he's not boring holes in buildings that were um, in use. Uh, they're slated to be torn down, but he didn't always have permission to go in them. Which brings up uh, his, the way he referred to these, he called them anarchitecture, <laughs> which is what uh, co a combination between two words, anarchy and architecture. Uh, so that these are, in, in, in one way or another, anarchical, dismantling of, of a structure, um, a, a compromising of a structure that in, in one way or another per speaks to anarchy, but does so in the language of architecture. It undoes buildings. It undoes their function. It undoes the space of a home, for instance, the security of a home. One of his more elaborate uh, projects for this is this building uh, in, in um, Paris, I believe it is, uh, that's called Conical Intersect, in which he bored a a conical or a, a um, cylindrical hole through the building on a diagonal <laughs> that looks something like this. So it went up through walls, through floors, through the ceiling, this hole that is, is bored through the building. And what do you make of that diagonal? I mean, it, it kind of, de depending on where you're at, uh, you'd be able to stand on the ground, like here, and look up through the hole, which, what, what sense do you make of that? Does, what significance might that have? 
that from the ground you can see the, the sky, see through the building to the sky. Is that interesting? <laughs> Light at the end of the tunnel, that's interesting. As though the building is the, the building maybe the society that uh, um, constructs the building is a kind of tunnel, a dark tunnel, something problematic about it, but there's hope or something through it by way of destruction. That's sort of difficult. What other, uh, what a, uh, other senses do you make of this? A portal, yeah, that has no regard for the solidity of a building. Yeah, a portal. I think it, it kind of also suggests, perhaps, that um, it either is being shot through from the ground, namely, uh, I want to see the sky, and so there's a sort of shooting through from a human point of view. I suppose you could also read it as a shot through from above, <laughs> this boring through the building from above, uh, however we might interpret that. Yeah? Kind of like, I don't know, I get a sense of being exposed, like being vulnerable. Yeah. The building is a sense of security. Yeah. If you have that complete. Yeah. It, it becomes insecure yes. and, and structurally compromised, deficient. I mean, the building would be torn down, but uh, at least in this portion of it, it probably didn't need a whole lot of help to come down, <laughs> right? It ruins the building in a way. It uh, ruins its function. He would refer to these also as, not only as an architecture, but as non-umental. He had all these kind of puns, I guess. Um, uh, so he, he referred to them as non-umental structures. Which, what, what sense do you make of that? A kind of, a kind of anti-monument, a mundane, a dismantling of the monumental. Once again, uh, this would be held in photographic terms and presented in photographic terms. And some of the things he did are fairly remarkable. I'm still not entirely sure how he did these. <laughs> creating these, it's almost like there's another form that is laid on top of and passes through a building, a structure. And it undoes the structure when it passes through it. And he seems to be quite interested in this. Structures that uh, have some other presence coming into them or through them, passing through them. Um, structures that lose their function because something else has passed through it or been present in it. And it tends to be spheres, right? Spheres show up and they, they make absences. You get spherical absences in buildings, in uh, objects. And so I've mentioned the photograph as a means of documenting these places and these the, these compromised spaces. But he would also sometimes present not only the photograph as an artifact, but actual artifacts from these buildings, portions that had been removed that then get displaced and transferred to a museum or a gallery that have this history built into it, these different surfaces uh, from a building that had been laid down at different times, um, th the place of a home, the place of an apartment, the place of an office building that has a history built into it and into its surfaces that gets removed from its context and set in into the specifically decontextualizing space of the museum or the gallery. And they serve as these artifacts that we have no kind of way back to. They, they are removed. They're, they're chunks that have a history that have been removed from their history and removed from their place. They become displaced or non-placed. And some of them are pretty elaborate. If you, if you happen to see a Gordon Mata Clark exhibition, <laughs> it will be primarily comprised of photographs and 
portions of structures that have been removed and replaced, displaced and then replaced. What, is, what does this do to you? Does it do anything? Cause you to think certain things, feel certain things? Like a what? A, a pop-up book. Ah, there's something that feels artificial and flimsy. Yeah, when it is presented as its own thing, on its own thing. This is not something that is supposed to be presented. It's not something we associate with uh, an object, uh, or it's not an object that we make for presentation. This is a, a, an object that is made to give shape to our lives. Right? To provide me space that is my bedroom, or space that is a study, or that is an entryway. It's a space where we greet people. It's a space where we close off everyone from this so that something can happen there, right? Th this is an, an artifact from those objects that give shape to our lives and to our spaces. And there's something about the way that he cuts through them and he removes them that, um, I don't know, perhaps, perhaps makes us more aware of the ways that, the particular ways that we give shape to our lives, right? The, um, the, the, the way our homes or our institutions, our classrooms are divided up, in one way or another shape what's possible in that space, what's impossible in that space, what happens there. It shapes our patterns of relating to each other and so on. Yeah? Because huh. like these buildings, like we take, we can take everything else apart, but you think of taking a building apart, just it just seems impossible. Huh. You know, for you to take and just cut a chunk out yeah. of the room, like huh. it just seems impossible. So huh. if you think of a house or a building being very solid and huh. there and not really that easy to take apart, but he just like destroys it and <laughs> makes it seem so temporary. Huh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Temporary, maybe somewhat. Um, artificial or provisional. It's not the way things have to be divided. It, by doing this, it makes it seem uh, more, more provisional, more temporary, is what you're saying. It could be a, a otherwise. And I mean, you can, th this does sort of um, follow you around in one way or another. I mean, if there was a hole behind this wall uh, or in this wall, uh, if it was just removed uh, suddenly, then the way, what would be possible in this space would be totally reorganized. The space would have a different function, a different organization to it, a different meaning to it. Um, and he seems to point that out. Oh, my, my, my life has a certain shape, but that's a malleable shape, <laughs> depending on where I live, how I've uh, structured space and time. Yep. Yeah. Ah, that's a good suggestion. What function do you think he adds if he does? I mean, he takes away certain functions. Like, even if that building is abandoned, you couldn't move back into it once he does that <laughs> to it. So he's certainly removing some kind of functions, but it's quite possible that he's adding others, like your ability to see the sky through the thing. Um, uh, and I suppose, uh, from, an, from an artist's point of view, um, he's adding the function of critically assessing the building, the way that we build buildings. And that is, that is where the argument that it's art. Doing this to a building makes it art because it causes you to uh, reflect on uh, what is the meaning of this building? How have we built, building, built, uh, built buildings? How, how, what do they mean to us? How do they shape our lives? Once he gets you asking those questions, then uh, he's added the function of art and reflection to the thing. That would be the argument. We'll go Amy and then back here. Yeah. 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 It's not that someone like chopped it up and used it for firewood. Yeah. It's the kind of thing that if you saw it and you didn't know what was connected 
into it, you would be really, really confused. Yep. And it would work just as well in a sci-fi movie where you're like, oh my gosh, yeah. some foreign species showed up uh, this, uh, we don't know why. Uh-huh. Because it, like, it doesn't make, it's a destruction that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. It specifically removes all function from the object. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Right. And there you're in that then you're in Duchamp's territory. If you're asking that question, art. <laughs> right? That that would be the that would be the conceptual argument. You're now wrestling with concepts. The concept of doing this thing. And once you're there, it's no longer a, a it no longer has a stable function other than philosophizing or art making, art thinking. Yeah. Yeah. The statue by doing that, like, like we think of a house as like having individual things that are very like aesthetically pleasing or they were crafted very well, but you don't really think of the house as like a whole. Mm -hmm. And so when he takes like a chunk of the house out and puts it somewhere else, like you really like, you don't think about like the individual things because it's kind of like, you know, kind of destroyed and everything. But at the same time, you really think about like just a visualness of the house as a whole, just the interesting yeah. lines and you know, textures and different aspects that go into creating a house. Yeah, 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 yeah. For whatever reason, and maybe I shouldn't think this, but um, whenever I was looking at those pictures, I just kind of got a sense of freedom, like he's freeing himself. Huh. Like for the conical intersection, if you were standing at that point, where in the picture where you showed and you can see the sky through it, you wouldn't have been able to see it. Huh. That wasn't there. Huh. Uh, yeah, it, it does seem pretty plausible to read because everything he does for the most part is destructive, right? I mean, there's this pretty strong destructive element to it. And it seems to be, it seem, there seems to be the implication that this shouldn't have been the way that it is to begin with, right? Yeah. And so it comes, it does come off as as maybe critique or critical. Yeah, good. Yeah. To me, like, even though it's destructive, it doesn't, it's not necessarily, like, negative. It's not, like, taking away the value mm. of things. Mm -hmm. It's kind of, in a way, it's kind of a constructive destruction because it's uh -huh. making you focus on something else that you didn't yeah. focus on. Yeah, yeah, good. And, and we get this, we, we've been seeing this in various ways through the course up to this point. There's just this common strategy in work that is generally referred to as postmodern, as uh, the strategy of interrupting for the sake of reassessing a thing. Or um, you interrupt it so you break, you break the routine, you break our routinized ways of looking at things and regarding things, you interrupt that so that we start to reflect on our routines, the way things are. Whereas when they're all in place, sometimes uh, we just take them as they are and we keep going, we stay in our routines. There's a pretty um, applied differently here than we've seen <laughs> up to this point, but a similar kind of strategy, yeah. Good. Okay. Uh, so that's Gordon Mata Clark. We'll we'll move on and, and look at a uh, move on down the line historically and look at a few other artists who I think are tying into this dialogue and are um, would roughly be located in Krauss's field on the axiomatic structure side. Um, this is Rachel White Reed. She's a British a contemporary British artist. Um, and this is called House. And initially, what do you notice about this photograph? What's odd about it? There are a lot of things odd about it. And House is, by the way, the object that she's made, not just the photograph. Though, once again, um, all we have left is photograph, <laughs> our photographs. Completely isolated. Why do you think that is? I mean, would that kind of a house, this sort of 
three-story, tightly squeezed uh, sort of condo apartment um, building have been all alone? Probably not. It seems like there's a great deal missing out of this image. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, good, good. I, I, I mean, I think that gets us into this pretty quickly. Um, this uh, location in London, um, and it was on 190, this is 193 Grove Road in East London. It was, a, it was a neighborhood that was fairly dilapidated, fairly run down, fairly poverty stricken, that um, the council, the city council decided uh, uh, should just be gradually uh, kind of evacuated, people um, um, moved out uh, and, and torn down uh, so that it would make room for new development. Um, it, the neighborhood dated back to the 1870s about when, when this home was built. Um, and so the whole place is slated to be torn down. Uh, Rachel White Reed got permission to do an installation in one of the homes before it was torn down. So the family had left, uh, the residents had left, and she's going to do an installation. And what is the installation that she does? Yeah, it, it's cement, it's concrete. Um, and then, so, so she fills it with concrete, um, which it's not solid concrete, thankfully. <laughs> it's a, 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 that would be a whole lot of concrete, but it is formed concrete uh, uh, um, um, that's fairly thick, thick enough to keep the whole thing supported, but uh, not solid all the way through. Um, so fills it with concrete, and then as scheduled, the whole neighborhood is torn down, including the house. Right, the house is torn down, but what remains is this interior form. I mean, she's basically doing concrete casting, and what's the cast? It's the house. Uh, so you tear it down, you tear down the house, and what remains is a positive form of the negative space. So the negative space that filled the house uh, that would have been occupied and lived in for all those decades, for well over a century, um, th those spaces that would be occupied and lived in became solid. And what was solid, the walls, gets torn down and becomes, becomes absent. Um, and as it's torn down, uh, certain floors, certain walls are kept, um, captured in between these negative spaces turned positive. And then you get the impressions of all the walls, the heaters, the fireplaces, um, the, the, uh, the wainscoting, the doors, the windows. You get impressions of wallpaper, residue from the walls itself. How do you read into this? What does it mean to do this thing? Maybe even just what are some ways we could describe this? I mean, it seems like a monument of sorts, right? But a monument to what? Of what? Yeah. Yeah. And, and the negative space doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. It's kind of like doubly a bit odd. Yeah, good. Kind of like a Yeah. 
memory of like what the actual building was yeah. like, in terms of the wallpaper, yeah. in terms of like residue from the actual walls yeah. itself. It's like it's like it's like the history or like the like the part of the building is still like somehow like on it. Yeah. And so it's like it's it's weird to like make the metaphor of like a tombstone, but like it's it's like it's something of like what whatever the tombstone of the monument is commemorating is somehow part of still like that monument. Yeah. Yeah, good. Yeah. Um, even, even so, though, like you still have no idea how those people live. Like you don't mm -hmm. see them, you don't see their uh, inside of it, you don't see yeah. pictures hanging on the wall. It's yeah. Still kind of. It, yeah, you get the walls, but the space inside, the space that was lived in, is now dead. Like it, the the. Um, the space of living has been eliminated and turned solid. Uh, so it's, there's no more potential. It has turned dead. Yeah, that's right. So you just get traces, remnants of the surfaces that these people lived in between. Yeah. Kind of like the house is mummified. Mummified, yeah. I mean, if, if we don't describe it as a, as a tombstone, maybe the more appropriate analogy is the death mask. If you, if you are aware of, uh, historically before photography, especially, when people would die, especially famous people would die, they would take a cast or a mold of their face and then they would cast that. So if you go to Florence, you can see Dante's death mask. Uh, the, if you have taken drawing one here, you draw that white, that white face that white face is Beethoven's death mask. <laughs> I don't know that we told you that. That might have creeped you out while drawing it. Um, uh, but uh, it's this kind of recording of the surface of a body, the surface of a face that no longer is, is lived in, no longer has potential. Uh, it has is, it is turned dead, but it, it records the surface. That's right. It, 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 it gives you traces of that person traces of that face, traces of those histories of families living here. Yeah? And it's strange that it's concrete, which kind of dehumanizes it in a way, even though there's that residue of human life. Yeah. Concrete is something you step on. Yeah. To encase a house in concrete. Yeah. I mean, it's almost like the ground that kind of swallowed it up. Yeah. Like concrete is especially troubling, huh? Yeah. It's cold. It's hard. It's industrial. It's cheap. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and also, like, where was it the outside of the house, Jane? It's always the inside, like, redecorating, rearranging, things like that. So it's like the old reversal of, like, the outside being inside. Yep. Like, inside never changes and it become, like, functionless and, like, timeless. Yeah. Yeah. Good. I, I, that's well said. Yeah. Good. Um, so we have this, these, this home or homes, multiple. Uh, apartments, perhaps, or stores, or whatever, um, that that uh, were for decades alive with the you know this is the space of um, crying children and cooking meals and arthritic fingers fumbling with doorknobs and the television blaring and uh, yelling and crying and laughing and all of those things. The, 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 the histories that have unfolded in these places are all of those kinds of things that, that all we have here, once it has been turned solid, are traces and remnants of the walls. Uh, and so it, it does kind of persist as a ghost or as a, a death mask or something like that. And as the whole uh, neighborhood is torn down, this sort of stands as a monument to those kind of places, to the life that happened here. And, and given this place, I imagine lives that were filled with, with joy and goodness, but filled with quite a bit of struggle and quite a bit of tragedy. Um, and this stands as a sort of monument to those living spaces that uh, are, have, have been wiped out, for better or worse, they're gone. Um, and then this gets torn down, and if you go here today, there it's it has been all revised. I suppose you could you could interpret that then as a new a, a newness. This is a sort of death of this neighborhood, and and perhaps a revival or a remaking for better or worse. 
And I think that death and revival thing, you might be able to read into this as well. I mean, the, um, this is technically mold making. What she's made is a mold of the interior of the house. Molds are usually made in order to recast something else, right? You make a mold of an object, you make a mold of Beethoven's face, for instance, and then you use that mold to recast it. You fill it with plaster so that you have the, you have the head, you have the face. Uh, the, the, you re recreate the face in one way or another. There does seem, by making this a mold, there does seem to be this kind of, um, I don't know, suggestion of the house being rebuilt. Uh, that it's supposed to be recast. There will be some kind, I mean, I guess we could, we could really allegorize it and say there is supposed to be some kind of a, a, a remaking of this, a redemption of it, a resurrection of it, a reconstitution of homes, uh, this kind of home perhaps, maybe in a, maybe in a, in a, in a better way, <laughs> a, a more glorified way. I don't know, I, I, I'm pretty sure White Reed wouldn't have uh, interpreted this as a symbol of longing for resurrection and restoration and redemption, but we might read it that way. She doesn't have authority over the meaning of the work, does she? Yeah. future. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's nice. So it really does fit into the monument uh, genre pretty well. Yeah. Good. Just to kind of finish out uh, White Reed, um, she takes, this, this is her sort of mode of working, her primary mode of working, is rendering negative spaces into positive forms, positive objects. So stairwells. Once they become solid, then the, the potential of moving through them and interacting with them is, is lost. And maybe it's not just removing, maybe we don't just read it as death, as a removing of potential, maybe it's a marking of the spaces in which we live our lives. Um, by, by rendering them positive, we get a picture of the form, the forms it, in which we live our lives. We don't live our lives in the chairs, we live our lives on the chairs or between the chairs. We don't live our lives, you know, it's somehow in the room even, or in the walls, but between the walls, in this space. Um, she, uh, I think one of her more interesting ones is this, it's a library, and what she has done is cast the space in between the books. So you, uh, these are the shelves, this is the space in between the books on the inside of the shelves, right? Um, and uh, as, she, as she casts them, you get these records of the, of the books, the various books, and the space between the books. Um, and all of these colored lines are where the bits of the fabric have torn away and gotten themselves attached to the, the plaster. I think it's plaster in this, in this case. And, and how could we read into this idea of, uh, of casting the space between the volumes? I mean, it, it makes the volumes, I, I mean, we, we regard the library as containing 
lots of knowledge, right? Lots of ideas, lots of concepts, um, all of which are good. Books are wonderful. Um, but by casting the space in between them, it draws our attention to the way that this knowledge is organized, the way it's presented to us in one way or another, or held, um, and uh, it really makes concrete the uh, sort of, in a metaphorical way, the space between what we know, the, spe the space between the volumes, the unaccounted for space. <laughs> I mean, the library holds knowledge, but it's also got a lot of empty space, metaphorically. There's a lot that's unaccounted for, unknown, perhaps, in this kind of work. At any rate, even if we don't read into it on those terms, we certainly have the terms of the, 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 this draws our attention to the, the organization of the, of the knowledge, the organization of the knowledge, uh, of, the, of the volumes, the space in which we do our practices of scholarship and so on. Um, good, anything you want to say about that, about the library piece? Yeah. Oh, it does. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah, that's nice. Huh. Yeah, good. Um, so at any rate, uh, we've been looking at a few uh, different artists during this, uh, during this morning that are um, taking as their subject matter, as their um, kind of material even, architectural space. Some of those artists have been using architectural space to build um, and harness light and space to give us experiences of, of, of light and space. Um, others seem to have much more of a social or cultural bent on, on those spaces, drawing our attention to the way that architectural spaces um, shape our lives, form our lives in one way or another. Um, and that, that kind of uh, cultural critique of the spaces in which our society lives its life uh, is probably where you could, I mean, we're gonna talk about performance art for this afternoon, and performance art and, and what we've been talking about with these axiomatic structures, I think are the way you get to the, the, the kind of common uh, street art movement that's been happening. Um, I was gonna devote a uh, a whole lecture to street art because there's been so much talk about it lately. I think I'll probably compact that a little bit because uh, we're running short on time. But I want to put some of it here and then I'll put some of it later on. And I think the thing with street art is it's this, it's this strategy of interrupting the spaces in which we live lives, live our lives especially socially, culturally, in order to point out the way that we live them. Um, and I'll run through just a couple of artists that we might group in this category. Um, uh, East Eric, as he goes by, is someone who just takes a fire hose <laughs> or a fire extinguisher filled with paint and just puts out fires, I suppose, with paint. There aren't actual fires, but he turns the fire extinguisher on, the, on public spaces like benches, railways. Other artists are less destructive, I suppose, um, and uh, just take what a space gives them and groups it, rearranges it. An artist named Spy does this by raking leaves, for instance, sweeping leaves, or altering uh, tennis courts, places where we play games that have lines on them that are organized in certain ways, and he adjusts them, causing, calling attention to the, the organization. And street art has a lot of playfulness to it. <laughs> um, but there's a, the, I think the best forms of it, there are these gentle interruptions that specifically target the way that s public spaces are organized. Some of them causing some, you know, uh, varying degrees of uh, annoyance, inconvenience, street signs adjusted, changed, <laughs> stoplights just adjusted a little bit, not ruined.
And certainly the most famous of, of the street artists right now is a guy named Banksy. We'll talk a little bit more about Banksy perhaps next week. Um, but just to allude to him here as someone who is uh, turning his attention on architectural structures, namely public architectural structures, and altering them, adjusting them. Is, he's not really axiomatic in the sense that he's, I mean, he's applying paint to walls, but he's taking up public space and uh, specifically criticizing the way that that public space shapes our lives. So he paints, for instance, some of his most famous paintings are on the, um, the wall that divides Israel from Palestine. Disrupting that wall, calling attention to the wall. Not that the wall needs all that much attention. It's got plenty of attention, but he adjusts them, alters them. And he's, he, I think the thing about Banksy, whatever you want to say about him, the thing about him is that he's awfully economical in the way that he works. Not economical in terms of cost. Economical in terms of, oh, you take a, you take a really kind of urban space that's formed by concrete and by bricks and so on that, is, that proclaims that space is set aside for parking. And if you just paint over the ING and do so in a way that you know that he has changed it, <laughs> sort of thinly painted out, you paint over the ING and you put a, a girl swinging from the A and the whole thing calls into question the way that this space has been set aside for a certain thing, parking for instance. And, and maybe that's a cheap sort of thing, calling into question, criticizing all of this, all of this language, but it's, it's awfully efficient, it's awfully effective at um, getting us to see, well, should this be a park? Do we have enough parking? What is the system that demands so much parking? Is that the system we want? And so on. And he just, he interrupts. <laughs> uh, he interrupts over and over again. It's the organizational systems, the lines that tell you where to go, the words that tell you what the space is for, the things that inform you how you're supposed to behave in these places. He adjusts them and alters them. Is that, is that a good thing? Is it a negative thing? Is it adolescent? Or is it profound? I'll let you come to conclusions on that. <laughs> but over and over again, it's, it's the places, it's, see, it's these same organizational symbols, right? This is where you're supposed to drive and where you're not supposed to drive. And he disrupts them. in a way that gets you to re-see the, the space in which you're living and that we're living. Um, sometimes uh, also bringing in not just the physical space of the city, but the digital space of the city. Uh, he seems to have a pretty strong undercurrent of love being difficult or impossible <laughs> when it's mediated or when it's, uh, I don't know, when it's, uh, when it's taking place in maybe this kind of space, but also uh, digital space. That's sort of a haunting work, isn't it? It's fairly troubling. <laughs> okay, I just wanted to tag on a little bit of street art here at the end. Uh, we'll get back to, to them and we'll kind of put them on the uh, after the performance, after we get a little bit more performance, we'll look at a little bit more street art, though I think since I'm a, a, about a lecture behind, we'll, uh, we'll try to condense that a bit. This afternoon, we'll try to deal with performance art um, and the use of time as an element in art making, altering not just the spaces of our lives, but the actual routines of our lives is what performance art is going to do. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.